Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, let's do it. Highland Warrior Girl, Ahsoka, Amelia, whatever you want to be called. Thank you so much for making that first uh, contribution to the channel. I wanted to wait until I got a few thousand subscribers. I'm afraid of the image it would it would give. Um, yeah, we're here about learning history, but any contribution is very much appreciated. Okay, let's do it. Oh, I had to fix this. All right, one second. Let's go. Hope you're all doing well. If you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video, top of the description, right below that, link to the Discord. Just click on it. It'll send you right over there. Love to have you. Makes it easier for me to interact with you guys. Uh, yeah, pull up a chair. More the merrier. And yeah, if you're not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Home Mac is down the hall. Make me a eggplant parm sandwich. I like eggplant parm even more than chicken parm. I guess a lot of you people around the world call it aubergine, I think. Anyways, let's do it. Hunger, snow, and fatigue had narrowed all the possibilities of this war down to one stark inevitability. Peter and Charles would meet on the field of battle to decide the fate of the Baltic world. Charles had brought his forces into the Ukraine. He hoped his army would be able to live off the land. More than that, though, he hoped for two great reinforcements. First, he hoped to meet with the supply train that he had opted not to meet up with on the retreat from the Moscow campaign. And second, he hoped to engage Ukrainian Cossacks to serve as his allies. But now, Peter himself was on the field. As the supply column that had been supposed to provide relief to Charles XII turned south to meet with the main army, Peter intercepted it. The Sorry, pausing. How did he get there so fast? I thought he was still up near St. Petersburg or whatever it was called at this point. To Charles XII turned south to meet with the main army, Peter intercepted it. The initial fighting was fierce. Again, the Swedish army was half the size of the Russian force. But despite this, for a moment, it looked as though they might shatter the Russian forces anyway. This time, though, Peter was with his army, and with him, the hardened elite Russian guard, who stood firm and anchored the wavering line. The fighting turned into a brutal slog. By nightfall, neither side had made any conclusive blow. Both sides withdrew with the setting sun, the Russians to the nearby woods and the Swedes to their defensive position. The Russians settled in to rest, but the Swedes stayed in battle formation, fearing another attack. As the night drew on, though, it became clear that no new attack was coming. So, rather than fight against rested and reinforced Russian troops with his exhausted army, the Swedish commander ordered a withdrawal under the cover of dark. But as they crossed the muddy ground behind them, the wagons and the artillery began to get stuck, slowing them down. Abandoning some of their artillery and baggage, they managed to make it to the nearest town, but the bridge they needed to truly make their escape had been burnt by a Russian detachment. See I'm getting major deja vu right now from the Epic History TV Napoleonic War series. Seeing this, they needed to truly make their escape had been burnt by a Russian detachment. Seeing this, the men began to panic. But the Swedish commander made the tough choice. They would unload the wagons, carry what supplies they could, and burn the rest. Unfortunately, in these wagons was, amongst other things, the army's alcohol rations. Weeks worth of it. Such a waste. So as the men began to unpack, many of them also took the opportunity to consume the liquor that they would be throwing away. Soon, the army was drunk. Men got lost in the woods. Others had to be left behind. The orderly... To be fair, I can't, um, criticize. I would, I would likely be, uh, I would likely join them. The Swedish retreat dissolved into a chaotic flight. What few men were still good for fighting were given mounts, and these few thousand troops made their escape. No supplies from this caravan would ever find their way to Charles and the Ukraine. Charles's other hope for succor was a man named Ivan Stevanovich Mazepa. Ivan had grown up the bastard son of a minor Polish. I know this might be a stupid question. I'm going to say it anyway. I know Ivan has got to be a very popular name. I'm not exactly sure when Ivan the Terrible was alive, but they're not. I, I, never mind. Polish noble, but as a young page in the. Ivan had grown up the bastard son of a minor Polish noble, but as a young page in the Polish court, he had been caught in flagrante with a married nobleman's wife. 
He had been promptly tarred and feathered, then tied to a horse. With Ivan's face firmly tied to the horse's rear, the horse had been sent packing, running off unguided this. into the wild. Everyone had expected that Ivan would die on the Ukrainian steppe, but Cossacks had found him, untied him, and gave him a home in their tribe. Valorous and ambitious, he had risen within their ranks until, when he was 48, the tribe had unanimously elected him to lead them. For years, he had ably served Peter the Great, but secretly, he had always hoped to be free of Peter, to create an independent kingdom for his Cossacks. When Charles had begun rampaging through Poland, Ivan began to negotiate with him. After all, this Swedish king might have a real shot at overthrowing the Russians. Charles never took these overtures too seriously, though, at least not until desperate circumstances forced him to. As his campaign to Moscow began to fall apart, he reconsidered the value of this Cossack hetman. He agreed that, in exchange for the 30,000 horsemen that Ivan said he had under his command, the Swedes would offer their protection to the Cossacks. It was with the intent to meet up with this force that Charles turned southward. It was for this Cossack force that he abandoned the inebriated and ill-fated resupply train well, that was originally get... meant to catch up with him. Charles Ooh. needed these troops, and the sooner he could link up with them, the better. But Ivan Mazeppa had severely overestimated the Cossacks' loyalty to him. When he made his rebellion known, it was 3,000 Cossacks, not 30,000, that decided to follow him. The rest maintained their allegiance to Peter. Peter then burnt Ivan's capital and sent the bodies of Cossacks tied to crosses floating down the Dnieper to discourage further rebellions. By the time Ivan struggled into Charles's camp, he had merely 1,500 men with him and few supplies. Now cut off in the Ukraine, the situation for the Swedish army was desperate. They were using saltpeter instead of salt to preserve food. They didn't even have enough wine to give the sacrament to dying men. Isn't saltpeter what's in gunpowder? So Charles made a bold, didn't even have enough wine to give the sacrament to dying men. So Charles made a bold plan. He would attack the fortress of Poltava and gain a secure location for his men to rest and await supplies from the rest of his empire. But the privations of the winter had taken an even greater toll on his army. Almost all of his artillery had been left behind. They had almost no shot, and the powder had gotten so damp and water- Sorry, it just, it would have been funny if- if he was eating a yellow snowball. ...of the Sorry. winter had taken an even greater toll on his army. Almost all of his artillery had been left behind. They had almost no shot, and the powder had gotten so damp and waterlogged that men complained that when they fired they could see the balls drop to the ground 30 feet away. They had also lost much of their officer corps, and now that it was summer, gangrene was spreading through the camp. But still, they put Poltava to siege. Each day they tried to mine underneath the fort and use sappers to drop its walls, but without artillery the going was slow. Just like All the Vienna. while, Peter raced toward Poltava with a massive relief army. And then, Charles's legendary luck finally ran out. While overseeing the siege works, a stray bullet caught him in the heel, passing straight through his foot and embedding mm. itself near his big toe. That day, he rode and worked through the pain until his men noticed that he was ghastly pale. When they took him to his tent and cut off his boot, they found that his foot was a wreck. He would have to be carried on a litter for at Am least the remains of the right? campaign. Then, Peter reached Poltava. His massive army of 80,000 dwarfed the 18,000-ish men of Charles's army that were actually in fighting shape. This giant force arraigned itself in front of the fort and began to dig in. Still, Charles and his commanders chose to rely upon the expedient they had always relied upon, assault. At first, That's things insane. go well. Swedes overrun the forward batteries and the assault sweeps forward. But then things begin to bog down. Inopportune orders are given. The Russian line is given time to firm up. Between the men left behind to guard the camp and those ordered to maintain the siege, even while the main fight is going on, the Swedish army is down to about 4,000 men. The order is given. They are to rush the entrenched Russian line. Cannon fire rips through the line of charging men. Bullets rain down upon them. By the time they reach the Russian works, nearly half of them lay bleeding on the field. The king orders his litter raced to the front to encourage his men. One by one, his litter bearers are shot dead around him, until only three of the original 24 remain. The king's litter drops, smashed upon the ground. What few men are left surge forward trying to prevent the Russians from capturing their king. 
A major rides up, dismounts, and lifts the king onto his own horse, only to be torn to pieces by Cossack sabers moments wow. later. The king is whisked to safety, but at what cost? The army is routed, stumbling back across the steppe, disorganized. They need to cross the Dnieper to escape, but the Russians are fast on their heels. The Swedes are forced to make a difficult decision. The king is sent ahead with 1,500 of the fastest combat-ready cavalry they have left. The remainder of the army is transferred to one of the king's gen- Sorry, but, I mean, you're outnumbered, like, five to one. They're the ones in front of, you know, protecting their, their fort, well defended. And the king has a very bad injury in the foot. That means he can't do the, all the same charging into battle with his men. Um, I don't see what the upside was. Combat-ready cavalry they have left. The remainder of the army is transferred to one of the king's generals. Two days later, with the Russians closing the army's line of retreat, 14,000 of what had once been the world's finest army surrender en masse. Can the king escape? Can the Swedes recover? Join us next week to find out. That took a giant 180, that episode. I am going to do uh, number five right after this. Stay tuned, guys. See you then.